today's story is The Door at the Edge of the Universe Parts 1 and 2 by Melon the Felon. They say there's a door at the edge of the universe. They say we are not alone. We all just live on this side of madness after all. Phenomena that people don't understand are easily dismissed. UFO sightings are explained away, ghosts are medicalized into auditory hallucinations, and on and on it goes until little by little we've stripped all of the magic out of this world. We even know the time and circumstances surrounding the birth of the universe. But some mysteries still persist. Many ancient creation myths posit so-called ex nihilo creation, something from nothing. Even the modern creation myth, the dogma of science, is silent on the question of why there is something rather than nothing. A phenomenon often occurs at the moment before death in which a subject experiences an intense and inexplicable euphoria. Neuroscience tells us that this is merely the inevitable result of cascading neurotransmitters and global neuronal firing. The clearest footage of the assassination of John F. Kennedy has come to be known as the Zapruder film. And in it, Kennedy can be seen at the moment of his death being struck in the head by gunfire, supposedly by a single sniper's bullet, that which was fired by Lee Harvey Oswald. However, many amateur conspiracy theorists have noted that Kennedy falls in the wrong direction, feeling speculation that Oswald was either not the shooter or that a second shooter fired a shot from the infamous grassy knoll which was in front of Kennedy at the time. Were he to have been struck by Oswald's bullet alone, which was supposedly fired from the book depository behind him, the force of the bullet should have propelled him forwards, not backwards. What these well-intentioned skeptics fail to note, however, is that a bullet entering the brain causes an electrical signal to be sent from the central nervous system to every major muscle group in the body, causing them all to contract simultaneously. The pectoral muscles are far stronger than those in the abdomen, and at maximum force will overwhelm the influence of the latter. Thus, the subject throws their upper body backwards instead of merely acquiescing to the force imparted by the bullet itself. The phenomenology of near-death experiences provides some of the best evidence we can find on the door at the edge of the universe. It's not clear why some people report vivid visual, auditory, and tactile hallucinations after suffering clinical death, or why some of these involve so-called out-of-body experiences, while others undergo some of the more familiar religious rigmarole. I knew a man, years ago, who killed his son across a brutal span of three years. It made the news, but everyone outside of his immediate family has forgotten the boy's name, and it is spoken no more outside of courtrooms and lawyers' offices. He was sentenced to death, and eventually his appeals were exhausted. And then, as Banksy once lamented, the boy's name touched a man's lips for the last time. These were the early days of the pharmaceutical protest against the state-sponsored capital punishment, when the drugs required for lethal injection were in short supply. The days before civil rights groups pointed out that improperly administering these drugs can potentially lead to a slow, conscious death by paralysis, rather than the intended immediate and painless variety. To spare you some of the more technical details, why don't I just skip to the part where my acquaintance ended up frothing at the mouth and convulsing on the medical table, fully conscious and very much alive. Reflecting on the experience, he explained to me that in what he thought would be his final moments, he saw the door. And it was rather strange to describe, for it was not like any ordinary door. The door at the edge of the universe is not a wooden gateway, but merely a darker patch of space or such was how our murderer described it. Things watched him from the other side, he said, and indeed, watch us all. World War II was what you might call a high-pressure time. At least so it went for a while, until the battles of Stalingrad and Midway. The existential pressure, so to speak, must have been quite high. Doors are sometimes open and sometimes closed. Anybody who lives in a windy area can tell you that these two states of being produce very different results vis-a-vis -vis air pressure in a room. Much has been made, theotically speaking, of the atrocities which occurred during the high-pressure periods. Mass deaths happened under God's nose and prompted many to ask why he did nothing to stop them. 
it might be of more benefit to these people to ask why it was that he couldn't see them. Schizophrenics often complain of the effects of radiation from cell phone towers, from solar bombardment, and so on. These are, of course, actually real, but too weak to do any actual damage. I worked in a psych ward for a time, and I can tell you that there are many different types of people who come for treatment there. Addicts are common, the suicidal make up a large chunk of the population, but then there are the delusional. These are always the most difficult to handle. Delusional people are very hard to put on talk therapy, and so the doctors will pump them full of drugs first. And as much as they will deny it, a large part of the reason is simply to make them compliant to these demands. It just makes the job easier. But drugs are a lot like people, different strokes for different folks. There's a classic distinction between uppers and downers, but that's much too simplistic. The real difference between drugs is their ability to open you up or shut you down. Really delusional people have a very hard time filtering things out, and that's the source of their paranoia most of the time. These patients are much like cheap radios, mostly picking up useless noise, but occasionally tuning into something you might want to hear. Ben was the first one to tell me about the door. He actually fell into two categories of mental illness. He was both delusional and suicidal. He had survived an attempt brought on by the stress of constantly looking over his shoulder for CIA kidnappers. For a survivor of MKUltra, this is almost certainly forgivable. He told me of a dark patch in space, far out beyond the reaches of the galaxy, a nightmarish thing he had seen in that liminal space between life and death. A gateway beyond which all he could see was the void. All he could hear was silence. And all he could feel was the dread. Lee Harvey Oswald defected to the Soviet Union following his discharge from the United States Marine Corps on September 11, 1959. The official histories of his life will tell you of his romantic troubles, his turbulent employment history, and his tumultuous relationship with the Soviet government. But. It is really only that last piece that holds any water upon further scrutiny. Through a series of clandestine meetings with elderly former Soviet bureaucrats, and the subsequent palm greasings which such meetings inevitably entail, I managed to get my hands on some documents purporting to be top secret reports to the highest echelons of the Soviet government from various KGB agents and officers. Some of them make reference to a Soviet mind control program, which has never become public knowledge, Apparently, the KGB became aware of the CIA's MKUltra quite early in the program's history, and grew increasingly alarmed by what they perceived to be American superiority in the field of psychological torture and mind control. One of these documents, a single yellow page covered in tiny print, concerns Subject 76, described only as a former American Marine in good health. My acquaintance on death row was eventually executed properly, though I cannot vouch for it having been painless. In fact, his soft gurgling and bulging eyes made it quite clear that it was not. I watched the last moments of his life play out behind bulletproof glass under harsh and sterile lighting. But before this, he was permitted to speak his last words, an apology to his victim and family, several religious appeals, and a confession that he did not deserve clemency. But these were not actually his last words. As the drugs entered his veins and death began to claw at his throat, a single tortured cry rose from his lungs and punctured the solemn air. It's closing. His father always locked the door around nine. It wasn't a hard cutoff sometimes, he did so earlier and sometimes later. But it inevitably happened. I'm given to understand that Freddy was forced to sleep on the floor of the closet without any sort of covering whatsoever. It was a small empty room and nothing more, but through the slats in the door he could just make out vague shapes and dim shadows passing in the distance. A humanoid figure knelt there for hours and since his father was the only other occupant of the house, Freddy concluded that this is who it must have been. At first he thought that he was praying and thought this was an ironic development. But it soon became clear that this was not at all what he was witnessing. His father was muttering and kneeling, but what words he could discern had nothing to do with God or holy books. They were only these, open, closed, 
open, on and on and on throughout the night. At the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, one man saved the human race from nuclear war. His name was Vasily Arkhipov. Vasily was the only officer on the Soviet submarine B-59 who refused to agree to deploy a nuclear torpedo against the American forces which were dropping depth charges in an attempt to force them to surface. All three officers had to authorize such an action, and his restraint almost certainly averted nuclear catastrophe. Arkhipov was subjected to disgrace and ignominy upon his return to the Soviet Union. This is a superficially baffling truth unless you understand that Arkhipov was never meant to return at all. The records I have managed to recover indicate that his assignment to the B-59 was a mistake, and that elements within the Soviet government intended for the missile crisis to escalate to an all-out nuclear war. No specific justification is given in any of these documents but interrogation transcripts from the torture and brainwashing sessions to which the other two officers, Valentin Savitsky and Ivan Semenovic Maslenikov, were subjected indicate that after their third month in detention, under heavy sedation and the influence of various psychedelic drugs, they would only repeat the phrase, close the door, when spoken to. There were several more incidents throughout the Cold War that nearly brought out a nuclear exchange between the United States and the USSR. During the Northeast Blackout of 1965, a series of nuclear bomb detectors malfunctioned and seemed to indicate a massive Soviet nuclear strike, nearly triggering a species-annihilating counter-response. On the 26th of September 1983, Stanislav Petrov was manning the Moscow-based early warning nuclear detention system which registered a single ICBM inbound from the United States, and later, four more. By refusing to notify his superiors of what he believed to almost certainly be the result of a technical error, Petrov prevented a nuclear response which would similarly have ended the sordid history of the human race. Petrov was ultimately demoted and driven to a nervous breakdown. After the end of the Cold War, another incident occurred on January 25th of 1995, after Norwegian and American scientists launched a rocket for the purposes of scientific research, which Russian radar identified as a possible nuclear strike. Despite the fact that Russia had been forewarned of this launch, neither the radar operators nor the Russian president, Boris Yeltsin, had received this message. Yeltsin activated a so-called nuclear suitcase for the first and only time in the history of the atomic age. Ultimately, radar confirmed that the rocket was not part of an American attack and Russian forces stood down. The radar operator who did so subsequently disappeared along with any record of their existence. My friend on the psych ward told me stories constantly. It became like the chirping of crickets on a hot summer's night or the hum of an air conditioning unit of the same white noise I hardly registered. It became like the chirping of crickets on a hot summer's night, or the hum of an air conditioning unit on the same white noise that I hardly registered. Ben told me fantastic tales of meeting long dead historical figures and time travelers and interdimensional beings, and so I learned not to place too much stock in anything he said. One day, he explained how he had been abducted by aliens while sitting in his outhouse. It was a sweltering Texas evening, hot and muggy, but with that eerie calm that still hangs about in the remotest parts of the rural south, suddenly a blinding light shattered the tranquility and discomfort and tore the outhouse to pieces. In an instant, Ben found himself sprawled upon a cold metal floor, his pants still about his ankles and his head in terrible pain. Voices chattered just beyond his field of vision, which was limited by an overwhelming whiteness. He reached out to touch it and immediately felt intense pain. He instinctively retracted his hand and fell backwards. These voices were not speaking any identifiable language, and indeed seemed to be making sounds that were physically impossible given the restriction of the human palate. The conclusion to be drawn was simple, and just as he was doing so, a much louder voice spoke alongside his own internal monologue in other words, directly into his brain. It asked him questions about his life, about his medical history, and on and on and on. He realized that these were something like rhetorical questions, for he need not answer any before the voice posed another. And then it dawned on him. 
If these creatures could speak into his brain, surely they could read from it too. But then, they asked a question that he could not answer. Is it open? This time he did answer, and did so with a response. Is what open? And just as suddenly as the whole ordeal had began, his mind was seized with an image, sharp and clear. A terrible blackness at the edge of reality, and with it came an inexorable sensation of terror. And then, it left him. Over and over again, the voice asked him about the door, and he could give no answer. It seemed that it was eventually satisfied that he really did not know the answer, for it stopped asking. But then the voice spoke again. You see things that other people cannot, Ben. Ben told the voice about his diagnosis, and of all the terrible trouble that they'd caused him. But the voice informed him that his mind was not diseased, it was awake and it saw things of cosmic importance. The voice told him that he would be returned, but that they would watch him, for sooner or later he would know the answer. He then lost consciousness, and when he regained it, his body was utterly immobilized, and not by any force that he could see or feel. He was lying perfectly flat on a metal slab with his eyes fixed on a ceiling covered in that same terrible light. In the next instant, he felt a blinding pain in the back of his skull, and he went to scream, but couldn't. He felt them crack open his head like a boiled egg, removing an entire section of bone and flesh, and then he felt the same thing but in reverse, and realized that he had been made whole again, but with a strange pressure in part of his head. He lost consciousness again and woke in his own bed, wondering if that whole thing had just been a terrible dream or maybe some new delusion. But as he stood and stumbled into this bathroom to retrieve a glass of water, he brought his hand to the back of his head and felt that same strange pressure underneath his skin. He ran his fingers over it and felt a perfectly rectangular protuberance just below the scalp. So that again, my friends, was The Door at the Edge of the Universe, Parts 1 and 2 by Melon the Felon. I love this story. It's a little hard to follow at times, which is kind of the point, I think, seeing as how the main person does have mental disorders, or the main person of the story, not necessarily the, like the, not necessarily the narrator. But honestly, even though it jumps, the story is pieced together so well and feels like a kind of like a manic episode, like, kind of like you're going crazy as you're reading it, I guess? And maybe I'm misreading that, maybe. But in my opinion, it works perfectly well in that order. It works perfectly well in this in this structure. Uh, Melon did a fantastic job, so thank you, Melon, for writing this. Again, this is parts one and two, and there are five total. The next video will be three and four, and then I'll just do five as its own. And then I'll probably do a video with all five parts in one, just because I like doing that. All that said, friends, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did and would like more content like this or content that is vastly different, please, 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 I beg of you, consider hitting that subscribe button and the bell icon next to it. Doing so helps the Nevermore grow. To support the Nevermore, you can do things like liking this video, sharing this video, uh, liking me on Facebook, following me on Twitter, joining the subreddit, or doing things like supporting my coffee or Patreon. All of these things help the Nevermore grow and become something larger than what it is currently, and are greatly appreciated. All that said, friends, I hope you will join me on the next video, but until then, sleep well.